My name is Elaine Papoulias, and I'm the executive director of the Minda de Gunsberg Center for European Studies, or CES, as we call it here at Harvard. I'd like to welcome you all to this virtual event, which is co-sponsored together with the Consulate General of Greece in Boston. It is truly an honor and a pleasure to convene this distinguished panel of speakers today. We come to you live from Boston, Washington, and Athens to discuss how Greece has countered and continues to counter the challenges emanating from COVID-19. As COVID-19 spread across Europe, and in particular with catastrophic results in Italy, many of you might have had the same reaction that I did. I held my breath as it was not quite obvious that Greece would follow a different path than Italy had. COVID-19 arrived in February 2020 to find Greece with an economy and public health care system that had been battered by crisis and austerity. The economy is about 40% smaller than it was in 2008. And as the crisis began, Greece had only 5.2 ICU beds per 100,000 people compared to Germany's 29.2. Moreover, the pandemic's arrival coincided with a new refugee crisis at Greece's land border with Turkey that stressed Greek attention and resources. Yet somehow Greece has not only emerged thus far with the lowest COVID-19 related transmission and death rates in Europe, but has achieved what many of us outside the country really and truly marvel at, solidarity, unified national purpose, and the rebirth of trust in governance. Our guest speakers join us today to discuss how all of this came about, as well as the challenges and opportunities that remain. In the interest of time, I will briefly introduce our speakers. They have many, many credentials, and I encourage you to check the website of CES uh, to read their, their full biographies. Uh, Ambassador Alexandra Papadopoulou is Greece's ambassador to the United States since February 2020. She is also the former head of the diplomatic cabinet of the Prime Minister of Greece. During her very long and distinguished diplomatic career, she has served as the permanent representative of Greece to the EU, the head of the Greek liaison office in Skopje, and also as deputy permanent representative of Greece to the United Nations. Anastis Kodoyorgis is the Secretary General for Coordination of Internal Pol Policies in the Presidency of the Greek Government. He completed his postgraduate studies in public policy here at Harvard at the Harvard Kennedy School in Public Policy and Public Administration. He is a lawyer of the Supreme Court and the Council of State. He previously served as an advisor to the Greek government between 2010 and 2014. Dr. Sotiris Chodras is a professor of medicine and infectious diseases at the University of Athens Medical School and the chief scientific advisor for the government's COVID-19 pandemic response. He completed postgraduate training in internal medicine and infectious diseases at Harvard Medical School. He is board certified in internal medicine and infectious diseases by the American and the Greek boards of internal medicine. He also holds a master's degree in the medical sciences from Harvard Medical School and was a recipient, recipient of the Clinical Investigator Training Program Fellowship conducted by Harvard Medical School and the MIT Division of Health Sciences and Technology. For many weeks and many days, he served as the primary communicator of Greece's status and standing in its fight against COVID. Without further ado, I would like to turn the floor over to Mr. Thanasis Kodoyoris. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. It's so great to be able to participate in this event today. And I would like to thank for the kind invitation, both Elaine Papoulias who is doing incredible work at the center and has always been fostering progressive and innovative public policies. And uh, Stratos Ekthimiou, our Consul General in Boston, who is steadily transforming the consulate to a hub of scientific and economic diplomacy. Uh, at the same time, I'm deeply honored 
to take part in this webinar along with distinguished speakers, Ambassador Papadopoulou, with a long and respectful career in the diplomatic corps, serving the country from various positions, and of course, Professor Chodra Sotiris, whose contribution in what we call a Greek success story is invaluable. We owe him a lot, and I'm privileged to have worked very closely with him for the management of this crisis. I definitely would have preferred to be able to be there in person, feeling like a student again. It was a very different time in my mid-twenties. When I left Boston, the country was on the verge of a historical election, resulting in President Obama's win. Uh, since then, the US, Greece, and in fact, the world has undergone tremendous change. The best we can do is cope with the continuous uncertainty that we face and create viable solutions to very complex problems. Uh, that is exactly what we tried with regards to the management of the pandemic. Slide, please. Uh, just eight months, only eight, after the national election, the government was faced with a global threat. Every important decision taken by the government on the road to managing the epidemic concerned human life, public health, as well as vital economic activities for the citizens. How did we cope with this unprecedented crisis in Greece? It is worth mentioning some points. Retrospectively, uh, they might seem obvious, but it was not the case at the moment the Prime Minister of Greece, Kyriakos Mitsotakis, took these decisions. In the initial phase, we had three main priorities. Limit the spread of the virus, reinforce the public health system, and adapt our governance structure to the management of quick reform. Actually, we received a negative criticism for these decisions in view of the economic outcomes, but it was clear to the Prime Minister at that point, and even more obvious now that there is no inverse correlation between the adoption of strict measures and an excessive downturn in the economy. Slide, please. At the same time, we began to reinforce the readiness of the public health system increasing intensive care units and available human and economic resources in order to respond effectively to the crisis. Few people know how hard that was in times of, global high, of globally high demand and low supply to successfully secure adequate protective material for our doctors and nurses. The Committee for Infectious Diseases, headed by Professor Chodras, immediately commenced its work and in collaboration with the National Public Health Organization, was monitoring the daily development of the pandemic and making suggestions to the political leadership. Moreover, we were persistent in protecting vulnerable groups of citizens. We managed to protect our retirement citizen homes with not a single death recording in public retirement homes. Slide, please. Finally, we had to adapt our governance structure to the management of the crisis. What we did was simple, but required tight processes of political, operational, and communicative coordination. Therefore, we took a three-step approach. Slide, please. First step, the coordination of the ministries and the rearrangement of all existing sources. The ministries were divided into three groups, all of them being coordinated by the presidency of the government and the minister responsible for the coordination, Mr. Skertsos. In the first category were the top ministries for tackling the pandemic ministries of health and civil protection, which we upgraded at the political and operational level. Uh, every morning, the prime minister was updated by the presidency, uh, ministers of health and civil protection, Kikilias and Hatalias, and Professor Chodras, of course. The second group were those related to the economy, and actually they undertook the work to alleviate the damage to businesses employees and individuals, and to mitigate negative spillovers after the shutdown of the economy. At the same time, we had to secure the uninterrupted functioning of all public services, especially the vital ones for the daily operation of the country. All other ministries redesigned their policies to ensure the continuation of their main functions and the support of our common goal. Moreover, a digital and operational war room, let's say, was quickly set up in the Prime Minister's office, through which he had real-time access to all the information related to the development of the pandemic, the daily utilization of the health system, and reports coming from the civil protection. 
the presidency of the government took care of the legislation and proper implementation of policies. Slide, please. The second step, step was the development of new processes. The digital factor was a game changer for the management of the crisis in Greece. The competent Ministry of Digital Governance, run by a fellow alumnus, Kyriakos Pirakakis, was able, right after the outbreak of the crisis, to accelerate the digital pro progress that the country deeply needed. Within a few only days, procedures were carried out for the better observation of the implementation of the restrictive measures. A national digital portal was created where many procedures that required face-to-face -face contact of citizens could now be completed electronically. Another portal was created in collaboration with the presidency of the government where every citizen could find all the information about the restrictive measures, the financial support measures, the social support services, as well as fake news that were circulating about the virus. At the same time, the public administration very quickly began to adapt to the new conditions of teleworking. Since about 70% of civil servants work from home, the same goes for education, where in a short period of time, a distance learning system was developed in schools and universities, which was attended by over 80% of the educational community. Final step, no, sorry, third step, the creation of synergies, especially with local governments and civil society. Municipalities, regional administrations lined up behind the central message of the government and strengthened the implementation of the measures while taking initiatives, especially through the Help at Home program to support the elderly, those who are most in need. Also the civil society, the church, big donors, donors the Greek diaspora, collaborate productively with the central government. Slide, please. Final step, the formulation of clear guidelines provided exclusively by the Prime Minister, our top scientist, Professor Chodras, and the Minister of Civil Protection, Mr. Hardalias. All decisions, all by their political, economic, and social dimension, had scientific argumentation at their core. This allowed us to establish an open line of communication with the citizens based on trust and transparency. Citizens trusted the state because there was a plan of action that everyone could understand. There was constant information provided, both at the scientific and operational level. And of course, this approach will continue. In the first phase, we succeeded, and the pandemic was an opportunity to regain a solid national self-confidence that reminds us that nothing happens on autopilot, that the real successes are up to us and depend on well-prepared policies and hard work. Next slide, please. So two unprecedented months passed, which concealed three more challenges for us. Return to normalcy, continuation of the reform agenda, and the resilient recovery of the economy along with social cohesion. Slide, please. Return to normalcy with as few losses as possible for society. The government had already begun drafting a recovery plan in early April. We found out early on that the decisions were complex and required the co-evaluation of many factors. Towards that direction, we set up an observatory. Its main mission is to compile information from heterogeneous sources regarding the healthcare system and the civil protection, the economic activity and the social impact of the recovery strategy in order to inform the Prime Minister and the intervention mechanism, a small interministerial group under the Prime Minister with the participation of experts to design the recovery in the best possible way and to evaluate its results. Through a structured and scientifically sound approach, we have reinforced the state's ability to monitor the progress of the pandemic and to continuously upgrade the effectiveness of our execution strategy. The observatory and the mechanisms, mechanism are now essential and permanent tools of the Hellenic Republic for the proper management of emergencies. Next slide, slide please. which actually was the continuation of adversity of the policies we have chosen as a framework for the transformation of the country. During the period where core policies were suspended, we decided that the continuation of policies that would modernize and make the functioning of the state more efficient, while at the same time realizing the dynamics of society, would be a key factor in the overall recovery. 
reform policies are being promoted without delays and hesitations. Next slide, please. Final challenge, the resilient recovery of the economy and social cohesion. After the lockdown period, our goal now is for Greece to be able to gradually emerge from the crisis with maximum potential safety. We have now entered the fifth week of restarting the domestic economy after the lockdown and things are going relatively well. High frequency data from electronic transactions suggest the hit to the economy has not been as large as some may have feared, although it is premature to draw final conclusions. Of course, the most difficult and complex aspect of the economic activities reopening is that referring to how tourism restarts and is deployed given that 20% of the Greek economy is connected to tourism. We already announced basic principles of our plan that will be finalized in the next few days. Next slide, please. A major economic contraction will require most likely something more than a simple restart. The economic recovery has been planned based on a multi-pillar structure, in particular on promoting research and innovation, giving priority to the green economy, achieving a surplus in the external trade balance, identifying new sectors with high added value and creating ecosystems. Recent developments in the EU with respect to the EU Recovery Fund fill us with optimism and a sense of urgency to redesign policies and insist on the reform agenda of this government. That's why we already formed a committee of highly esteemed professors and people coming from the market who will specify this new economic development plan. Nobel Prize winner Professor Tisaridis presides the committee. At the same time, our goal is to exit the crisis stronger, united, not leaving anyone behind by demonstrating solidarity and supporting all those negatively impacted, those facing unemployment who are at risk of financial ruin, not as a result of their own mistakes, but because of the economic consequences of the pandemic. Employment is subsidized, special programs are being designed to facilitate and make the operation of affected businesses financially viable. We have taken a first step in the right direction. Still, the road is long and difficult, and one that we must follow like we did during the lockdown period, with solidarity and consensus, individual responsibility and exhaustive planning. Next slide, please. However, and I will finish with this point, anything that we are referring to as success today cannot and has not been done in isolation. Collaboration and for the most part solidarity at an international level have undoubtedly contributed to our positive results. From best practice sharing and joint research programs to the commitment of EU resources to the crisis response coordination efforts, international solidarity and cooperation is the key to ensuring that public health policies will improve and we all move forward together. During such global challenges, we are all connected. For those of you in Boston, in one of the biggest R&D hubs and educational centers of the world, and for those big being privileged to be part of the global community here at Harvard, I allow me to say, urge you to choose to walk the path of transnational collaboration and not isolationism. This is the only way for the global community to deal effectively with major crises and prosper. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kodogiorgis. Ambassador Papadopoulou, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much and thanks uh, the Center of European Studies of the uh, Harvard University for organizing this event uh, and of course ULN for taking all this effort to put uh, this uh, panel together. There is no question that the handling of this crisis was a fine hour for Greece. One has to think where Greece was uh, just at the end of last year uh, when we were just emerging from a 10-year severe economic crisis. Uh, which had left no sector of Greek life unaffected. We all remember how shattered the public image of Greece was abroad. Uh, the negative uh, front page stories uh, in the major newspapers, uh, uh, some of them going beyond their journalistic uh, uh, reporting, but also promulgating stereotypes uh, so untrue and so hurting the Greek public. Uh, 
everybody seemed to, re to forget uh, uh, what Greece is all about, uh, a country with a long history, with ups and downs, good and bad points, uh, and everybody was pinpointing to all the minors that the Greek uh, uh, handling, uh, the Greek governance had in the last 40 years. And then at the beginning of the year, uh, in February, March, uh, Greece was hit by a double crisis. It was not only the pandemic. The first crisis was uh, the crisis in Nevros, uh, at the land border between Greece and Turkey, when uh, our neighbor uh, used the weaponized human pain uh, in order to attack, uh, really attack, uh, uh, the Greek uh, borders. And uh, there we were faced uh, uh, with an unprecedented event because we had to handle, on the one hand, uh, the empathy and uh, uh, that we feel as human beings uh, to people who really suffer, like uh, immigrants and uh, refugees, uh, and uh, our uh, human rights obligations uh, with uh, the inherent right of every country to protect its borders. And it was an organized effort, uh, well organized and funded by a neighbor country, fellow member of an alliance. It was hard, but we prevailed and we managed to handle the situation uh, in a very successful way. And then the pandemic hit. Uh, and there we had um, to face uh, the uh, uh, side effects uh, of this severe economic crisis on the health sector in Greece. Uh, and also a, a society that was really very much uh, uh, suffering for a long time from the repercussions of this crisis. The Greek government, Greece, has succeeded in having these wonderful records, unique records in fighting the pandemic and handling the situation. And if one asks why, what are the reasons behind it, I would say, uh, I would pinpoint to three factors. Early and concerted reaction, concise and credible message, and collective responsibility. So we're successful and this uh, um, reverberates uh, also in uh, outside Greece. Uh, suddenly we saw a difference in tone in how Greece is, uh, held, uh, is uh, dealt with uh, by the outside world. Uh, suddenly the, everybody understood and realized uh, that Greece uh, uh, suffered, yes, uh, has made mistakes in handling the economy in many years before, but still the Greek population has a unique metal and uh, the determination to get above uh, hardship uh, and manage its future in a better way. The rebranding of Greece uh, internationally after the pandemic, uh, after the double crisis and how well it was handled, both of them were handled, uh, is unique. Uh, and it's uh, a capital that the Greek government, I think, is uh, determined to use uh, in order to move forward to the next phase, uh, the reopening of the economy and uh, the re 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 refurbishing the economy, putting the economy back on track uh, in the long term, in a long term way. The, the pandemic also showed another thing, something that us, all of us in Greece always were fa in favor, collectivity. Our historical background and their geographical position has taught us years and years and years uh, uh, and over and over and over uh, that tolerance, cooperation and collaboration are cardinal rules in the world. Pandemics, uh, world problems, uh, uh, De demand world solutions. They demand cooperation. They demand collaboration. None of us can, can, can fight it alone. We all have to work together in order to find best practices, find cures, uh, find ways to move forward. But if you ask me what, what is the most, uh, uh, the, the, most uh, ex the biggest example of this new renewed um, belief in international cooperation and collaboration, I would say is the way the European Union transforms itself. I know there are a lot of criticism against the European Union over time because we are slow in making decisions. Sometimes our decisions is the common, the lowest common denominator. And there is a lot of bureaucracy, there is a lot of uh, state interest. All these criticisms are true. But at the same time, one should pay attention to the fact that the European Union, in the end, takes action. And in the end, despite the problems, uh, manages to go one way forward. And through this pandemic and the need to cooperate and collaborate uh, and face the new challenges, uh, the new world challenges, uh, they managed, we managed uh, to take even a, a big turn to the better, even in the economic sphere.
We manage, all of us uh, in the European Union, to get to a great extent over very strict, uh, narrow-minded, domestic, economic and social and political considerations to the next step, which is to create a more united uh, and more, I, I don't want to use this word, but I don't find a better one, federal. It's not exactly that, but we all know what I mean. Europe. And this is uh, the most lasting uh, um, effect uh, of this uh, uh, pandemic. I'm a big believer in science. I think the pandemic will go, uh, the vaccine will be found, uh, the medical science will manage uh, to take this, uh, to, 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 to make this a thing of the past. But what will be left out of that is the experience uh, that we have to work together that uh, we cannot look only in, into ourselves uh, and, and the European Union emerging as closer, more coordinated, uh, more united than before, even in areas that some years ago uh, were thought to be out of reach for this kind of cooperation, collaboration and getting together. Greece uh, will try to, uh, is a very uh, 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 is a, uh, a member of the European Union, a member of NATO, and long time ago we have proven that we believe in these collective uh, uh, organizations by giving up uh, parts of our uh, of our sovereignty to the European Union. You know, trade policies are not uh, a nation, the nation, the members' uh, policies; they're European Union policies. So we're firm believers, and we're going to work in this direction. But we also we're going to work in the direction of uh, enhancing our uh, relationship with uh, even our neighbors who are not part of the European Union, uh, and of course with the United States of America, uh, a long time ally, ally friend, uh, uh, and uh, a country with uh, the, cl the closest ties uh, in, uh, in the world with uh, Greece. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Papadopoulou. Dr. Tsiodras, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you much for inviting me. I'll stop my video because the uh, pandemic affected Wi-Fi connections as well and internet speed. So I have some slides to, to show to the participants. Okay, good. So crafting a strategy to deal with the pandemic, uh, we followed uh, the example provided by the European Centers for Disease Control, and you can see here those circles of, uh, that have to do with anticipation of a threat, uh, the response to a threat and recovery. And I have to say here that several countries that had established preparedness procedures actually failed uh, to implement them, anticipating something that was uh, milder. And uh, we hear today. Uh, uh, statements from uh, the Swedish uh, head of the Public Health Institute uh, um, uh, talking about uh, uh, the need uh, to revise the strategy that was a strategy that was focusing on, on, uh, on fewer uh, measures uh, than the ones that other countries took. Next slide. Next slide, please. So it's important, uh, it's important to enhance uh, all infrastructure. And uh, can you go back to the previous slide? Sorry. So it's important to, to deal with uh, very, very important issues like points of entry for a travel-related disease at the beginning and to, to have a system uh, ready in place uh, uh, especially uh, a first-line health professional and responder that will deal with uh, imported cases and uh, will transfer them to a designated treatment facility. And we dealt at the, at the onset of the pandemic with medical evacuation of potential cases. Next slide. It was important to enhance all infrastructure relating to our national health system. Uh, and that included, of course, uh, uh, healthcare facilities uh, with a focus on patient and public safety, according to a checklist published by the WHO, surveillance and response activities and risk communication. Those, those were the main three pillars of response. Next slide. 
This is the list we follow. Next slide. I'm going to touch a little bit about uh, basic principles uh, um, included in the list. We revised our pandemic plan in January when we heard the news about the new virus. And one month before our first case, uh, the Ministry of Health uh, uh, issued a, a decree uh, for 13 dedicated uh, COVID-19 hospitals in seven major prefectures covering the entire country. Next slide. So uh, we initiated uh, an operational infection prevention and control program that focused on triage and uh, we instituted multiple exercises and simulations across hospitals from early February. Next slide. Of course, uh, training uh, these people and uh, amongst the uh, fear of the unknown new virus was an important factor uh, in getting prepared. And uh, of course, uh, staff capacity was very important as well. And we increased our staff by several thousand, mostly nurses, registered nurses and, and MDs. And uh, the, the government, the Ministry of Health offered permanent appointments for tem temporary registered nurses and, and MDs. And of course, creating a primary care COVID network had its own challenges. Next slide. The war of the masks, as, uh, as it has been called by CNN, was a very important uh, piece of, uh, of our struggle. And there was a major challenge. Uh, solidarity was an issue. Uh, uh, we used non-stop over, non over special flights to procure equipment like masks. And we saw uh, the prices uh, raising several fold at uh, that uh, time. Next slide. Uh, of course, uh, uh, the issue of content and uh, we saw guidance by the European Centers for Disease Control with regards to new procedures for mass sterilization in case of so Of course, uh, uh, we had to invent, uh, as other countries did, um, new ways. Uh, uh, 3D printing was important and uh, the creation of face shields locally. Uh, thank God we saw no shortage of healthcare worker uh, and hospital staff uh, ended up being positive for the virus and of course mental and financial support. Next slide. Uh, we had a dual capacity system with regards to COVID intense. Several of the existing infrastructure uh, to to to, to, be, to, to function as an intensive care unit facility and we increased our, uh, we doubled our ICU bed capacity and we increased our step down units and uh, we used the help from the private sector and the military. Next slide. Next slide. And of course, the target by the end of this year is to, to reach uh, the European average of 12. ICU beds per 100,000 population, and we use very, very few of our uh, ICU bed capacity due to the effective response and the social distancing measures. Next slide. Of course, uh, the testing was a big issue. Uh, it was prioritized according to the European CDC guidance. Uh, we increased our capacity through this period uh, tenfold, but uh, I think there's a need rapid cheap uh, molecular tests, rapid antigen tests around the world right now. And we will have to use it uh, for the tourist period as well. Next slide. Next slide. We expanded our criteria for broader testing. Uh, uh, including asymptomatic and asymptomatic individuals with criteria. And we use to this effect a, mobile, a system of mobile units uh, across the entire country with, because you have uh, uh, unique uh, geographic um, areas like um, distant um, uh, islands, uh, small islands. Uh, and we used antibodies for uh, uh, serial epidemiological studies that confirmed uh, 
our mathematical modeling that a uh, very, very low percentage of our population was affected, close to 0.4%. Next, so, uh, an algorithm by a scientific advisory committee of 26 people uh, with several uncertainties that we changed a few times. We participated in clinical trials and we followed the strict regulatory process by the National Medicinal Organization. Next slide. Of course, the unknown effect of therapy early on and the ethical dilemmas of placebo trials for severe cases were important um, challenges that we faced during that uh, first uh, response to the pandemic. Next slide. We faced several pharmacovigilance issues and uh, an issue of under-reporting was the important thing uh, during the procurement of and uh, distribution of medicine. And uh, uh, the same, uh, uh, the same uh, issue came up with vaccine procurement and a joint, we participated in joint procurement process by the European Union. And of course, we had to face all this uh, time a conspiracy theories and uh, the 2009 H1N1 pandemic uh, vaccine, pandemic influenza vaccine failure. Next slide. We follow the landscape by WHO. At least 121 vaccines are in preclinical pre mode and 10 uh, are, are tested right now. Uh, we're following the results of these studies and we push for an open patent uh, for, this, uh, for the distribution of these vaccines. Next slide. Next slide. So the question about vaccine is whether it will be widely accepted. And this is a challenge for the future. Anthony Fauci uh, came out uh, over the last 24 hours and said that uh, we do not know that how, how long will the vaccine last. And of course, uh, the big obstacle would be uh, the refusal of the vaccine by the lay people, uh, something that has happened before in our country. Next slide. Our surveillance was our very, very important guide and we had a big uh, assistance and a very, very strong surveillance for hospitalized people uh, throughout the country, intensive care unit uh, people uh, throughout the country. And uh, of course, um, uh, deaths, we had a, a, a nationwide system of uh, reporting deaths and, and any associated death uh, with COVID. Next slide. So we managed to flatten the curve. And uh, of course, uh, uh, we studied uh, uh, the effect of our lockdown measures. And you can see here that the lockdown had the most important uh, effect in decreasing the R note. Uh, approximately 81% of the decrease in, in R note was attributed to the lockdown. But multiple simultaneous measures was uh, the important factor to, to bring the R note down to less than one. Next slide. Next slide, please. So here you see our surveillance uh, curves uh, by day of sampling, by day of symptom onset, and by day of infection. The, uh, the effective R uh, yesterday was 0.26, which is a great success for our country and uh, the people of Greece that uh, responded to social distancing. Uh, and this happened because of the communication, the good communication we established uh, at, uh, with uh, people. Uh, next slide. It was a tough thing uh, to communicate uncertainties uh, and we, we delivered special attention to this nation, uh, solidarity to vulnerable population like the Roma in the, the bottom right. Uh, uh, the, the combination of uh, being the press represent, president, representative and the frontline person as well is very, very difficult at these times of crisis. Next slide. Of course, vulnerable population issues were tough, were tough to address. We dealt with local outbreaks and I believe further multidisciplinary work is necessary. Um, uh, and 
I have listed here some of the issues. Next slide. Uh, we had tremendous help from mobile uh, units uh, that uh, went uh, to the field and, uh, and, and, and intervened in, in such uh, local outbreaks uh, that had to do with vulnerable population. Next slide. And of course, uh, some patient safety issues that have not been addressed or evaluated yet, uh, like uh, the effect of lockdown and fear to uh, access to healthcare. Uh, we created the any prescription mode uh, module to uh, that was adapted for the general population of chronic diseases. Uh, a decrease in the number of regular medical appointments as well as ER visits due to the fear and lockdown. Uh, the oncology surgery never stopped as well as uh, uh, emergency surgeries, but we decreased the number of elective surgeries. And of course, all those unrecognized COVID-related side effects. Uh, it's a multi-systemic disease uh, and we have to institute long and follow up with these affected patients, as well as the mental issues related not only to the disease, but of course, uh, to the lockdown itself. Next slide. Of course, uh, uh, quality assurance and, uh, and quality control is very important. And uh, a new agency will be created by the Ministry of Health uh, to deal with these issues and establish a national patient safety protocol and uh, to establish uh, cross-border collaboration uh, and share protocols as well as in, uh, invest in patient safety oriented research. Next slide. Uh, uh, a full functioning national medical registry and a digitization of the entire process is of paramount importance and uh, this will assist in improving uh, our uh, um, surveillance uh, towards what happened uh, with uh, the, the, the pharmaceutical uh, therapy, uh, the participation in clinical protocols, and uh, the access to services for all these people, and uh, of course, uh, recognize uh, uh, any gaps in the process. And uh, another another project is to improve uh, uh, hospital indices in other patient safety issues like multi-drug resistant organisms, and um, of course, uh, to establish better primary healthcare provision in this distant non-urban areas like the islands. And there's, uh, for this effect, and this purpose, a telemedicine project will start on June 1st. Actually started a day ago. Next slide. Of course, uh, easing restrictions is a, is a very difficult the potential for it. Yesterday, um, testing uh, amongst tourism challenges and, and uh, opening the gates of uh, some issues with social ending of the lockdown. Um, uh, people were very, very anxious to, to end uh, period. Um, we faced uh, several social issues with regards to schools and other sectors of the society. And of course, uh, the, 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 dilemma, the dilemma between punitive policies versus increasing education of people and the exhaustion of people from the lockdown. Uh, it was very important to collaborate with the politicians and uh, to develop a, a mutual trust uh, in this crisis. And of course, uh, the, 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 the essential uh, thing and the need to continue to intervene to prevent uh, the rebound of cases. Next slide. It was a teamwork. And of course, uh, I couldn't thank enough uh, Several people uh, or from the government, uh, the whole government functioned as a whole, and multiple stakeholders, the academia was involved, private sector assisted a lot, and this was uh, not a, a work of one person, but a work of the entire Greek uh, government and the, the entire Greek society. And uh, with this, I would like to thank you very much, and uh, we'll show you the next slide, please. As a Harvard graduate myself, I, I, I remember the days at Boston, and uh, and uh, I, uh, I have to tell you that uh, during this crisis, I felt more of a student rather than a professor. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Tsiodros, and, and thank you to all the speakers. Um, I, I will move to pose a, a few questions that we have received um, over uh, the course of the last couple of days from 
forum participants. Um, Dr. Tsiodras, the first question is for you. Uh, going into the crisis, what were the, your gravy, greatest areas of concern? Um, were, were there specific things that kept you up at night that you worried would thwart um, the, the successful combating of, of COVID-19? And as you described, uh, as the lockdown eases now and tourism uh, starts up again, what are the uh, areas of concern and, and what will you be closely watching um, and continuing to intervene in, as you mentioned? I think we've lost perhaps. Dr. I think I think I, I cut half of your question, but that's okay. I think what 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 uh, was very concerning at the beginning was uh, whether the, the healthcare system uh, would uh, meet uh, the capacity. Uh, the surge capacity issue was a very important issue at the beginning of this uh, uh, endeavor. And uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, intensive care unit beds and, uh, and, and uh, personal protective equipment for the healthcare workers were the most important challenge we faced at the beginning of the pandemic. Right now, I think the most important thing is to continue to follow the, the disease and its evolution in the, in the country with um, uh, uh, the testing and the tracing procedure. The tracing procedure I didn't talk a lot about but it was very very important in in facilitating our exit uh, uh, from the first phase of the pandemic we, we we followed tens of thousands of people uh, in order to to establish uh, uh, a, a pro to establish the isolation a proto protocol was followed and uh, testing right now and tracing would be the important factors in in, in addressing uh, a possible a potential rebound of course, uh, we will follow the the, uh, the effective R. We will follow that's based on hospitalizations and intensive care unit beds and uh, and, and and testing in our country. Uh, and uh, another big issue of concern is vulnerable populations like migrants and Roma, people with uh, limited access to healthcare, and uh, people that um, uh, you, you need multiple stakeholders to be involved in order to to deal with uh, with. Uh, outbreaks in these situations. Thank God we didn't have a lot of outbreaks there. there. There is particular interest to understand better what measures are being taken um, in migrant and refugee camps and what are, are the more particular plans um, in terms of uh, lowering the or, or keeping the, the transmission rates there low. The important thing there is to uh, to have uh, uh, immediate access to testing and of course uh, uh, to uh, decompress the, the, the refugee facilities from, from people that are high risk so high risk population within these facilities is uh, the first priority then is to establish better protocols for hygiene and uh, uh, and uh, decrowding of these areas so um, uh, it's very very important to to, to note here that uh, access to to vaccine would be very important for this kind of populations, vulnerable populations. It would be equally important to, to, to high-risk groups, I think. There's also a question about nursing homes. Um, the fate of patients in nursing homes in Greece stood in stark contrast to, unfortunately, the fate of many patients in nursing homes here in the United States. Um, how, how did you protect nursing homes? So what happened with nursing homes was the protocols for people working in, an, in a nursing home and, uh, and a visitation was um, uh, prohibited and um, uh, we didn't have any, any, any real instances of introduction of, uh, of, of COVID cases except for one nursing home in uh, the entire country. We have approximately 30,000 people uh, that uh, are taking care in nursing homes and only one of these facilities uh, saw a case of an, of, an of an introduction of the virus by a healthcare worker. And uh, we immediately intervened and, and, and uh, implemented measures to, to, to discontinue the spread. And we were successful in, 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 in preventing the 
spread in this very, very sensitive population. I think it had to do with very, very strict isolation of those facilities, um, even uh, with regards to visitation, something that is very, very uh, difficult, of course, as you can understand, especially for people that uh, may feel isolated. But we had to do it uh, to protect their lives. And now, gradually, we will return to normality for these uh, institutions. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kondogiorgis, as uh, Dr. Tsiodras mentioned, it was really the effectiveness of the lockdown and the public's participation um, that was the most important factor in keeping transmission rates down. Greeks were, were asked to make quite drastic and dramatic sacrifices, uh, much more so than uh, many of us here in the US. They had to register their whereabouts and the, the lockdown was much more draconian. Um, as you now open um, the country slowly to tourism, um, is there fear in, um, in jeopardizing all of those sacrifices? Um, yesterday there was a flight, many of us watched um, with bated breath um, this flight from Doha land and all of the passion passengers be quarantined. Um, what, what, are, um, what is the more detailed plan about um, how tourism will be handled um, specifically with ensuring that transmission rates don't surge? Thank you, Lane, for the question. Of course, it's a difficult equation with a lot of uh, unknown parameters. As you said, Greece is opening up to the world again. We are waiting for our visitors to enjoy the hospitality and share in our culture, our way of life, sea and sun. Uh, following a, a grueling period of lockdowns, uh, hard work and persistence, our country is a heaven for all of us seeking to recharge our batteries. Of course, we want it to be just that, a heaven. Therefore, we have put an agile strategy in place due to the peculiarities of the Greek landscape uh, to ensure the safety of both our visitors and our citizens. As we want everyone to feel safe and enjoy their stay with us, the ministries of health, tourism and uh, civil protection have drawn up a strategic plan to strengthen health structures for coverage of the islands and develop protocols to deal with potential new cases in remote areas, for example, there is a plan to increase the existing almost 400 beds to 700 if required and to increase the ICUs from 20 to 80 on the islands where patients can be looked after until they are transported to the mainland. Uh, the Ministry of Health has recruited dozens of doctors and more than 600 nurses uh, for the islands all across all health structures. Uh, as Professor Chodras um, mentioned, the expansion of the epidemiological surveillance throughout Greece is being extended to the islands. Uh, more than 25 uh, big and smaller islands are being strengthened with small molecular point of care tests analysts offering very fast diagnosis. And if there is ever a need for the transfer of a patient uh, or from an island, uh, there are boats available from both the Coast Guard uh, private suppliers in, in addition to existing air transfers. So in the next days, the full details of the plan will be presented. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador Papadopoulou, how has the pandemic provided new potential for cooperation in U.S.-Greek Greek relations? And uh, what are the, the current political, economic, and security challenges in the Western Balkans and Aegean region uh, and how can the U.S. support its partners, including NATO allies in the region, um, as they grapple with the immediate and the longer term effects of the pandemic? You're, you're muted, Ambassador. You have to turn off your... Okay. Thank you. Uh, Greece has the privilege to live in a very interesting neighborhood and a highly volatile neighborhood for years and years and years uh, throughout history, I would say. But uh, in the last years, we thought that all of us, so we found that living in that neighborhood, we 
we found a way uh, to live together, to cooperate uh, and to manage our differences uh, uh, in ways that are not destructive to any one of us. Uh, Unfortunately, in uh, the last period, we see that one of our neighbors, a fellow NATO member, uh, has reverted to old ways uh, and going from uh, zero uh, problems with neighbors uh, and uh, uh, now problems with all our neighbors. Uh, and this is, this is a destabilizing factor uh, where the United States uh, can play a very productive role. Uh, this is, um, there are many strategic and economic interests of all of us, including the US uh, in that part of the world. Uh, and uh, we, we count on uh, the support and the wisdom of the American uh, foreign policy in order to avert uh, developments that uh, are to nobody's interest. Uh, the cooperation with Greece with all the neighbors uh, in the Balkans, in the Western Balkans, and in the Middle East, uh, in Northern Africa, is very close. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, especially with the Western Balkans, we developed uh, uh, this cooperation went uh, to further depths uh, because we had to share the land border and the movement of people uh, that had to be restricted. Uh, and we had to find ways to uh, face this pandemic together, and I think we've been very successful. Uh, the cooperation with the U.S., I don't think we should limit it to the fighting this pandemic. Uh, the U.S. Greek ties uh, go 200 years ago, the modern Greek state and the U.S. Uh, uh, 200 years ago, and uh, it's a relationship uh, in which both countries never found it, uh, themselves against each other. The ties are deep, they're strategic, economic, cultural, uh, and of course there is uh, the biggest tie, which is the Greek-American community. Uh, a bridge between the two countries and uh, a means of better understanding and, and uh, cooperation. Uh, this relationship, it, I think, is unbreakable. Uh, and I think despite challenges, uh, is there to stay. And uh, the, as I said before, the role of the U.S. Uh, as a big country uh, with interest in the region uh, is uh, valuable. And uh, this relationship is going to continue, uh, that's for sure. The, the thing that I would like to add is that Greece is a safe country. Uh, it's a safe uh, from the social, economic uh, point of view, political. It's a very stable country. Greece managed to get out of the 10-year economic crisis uh, and the crisis of the last two months uh, in a way uh, that left intact social cohesion. Uh, and the political system is more stable than ever, uh, one of the most stable in the world, I would say. And the economy is uh, an appealing economy, gives uh, appealing opportunities uh, to people outside who want to come and see and invest because we have a, a very talented young population uh, who are well, well educated and eager to work and do miracles and uh, we have uh, together with uh, the social cohesion and the political stability I cannot think of a more appealing environment for investors to come to Greece. As far as tourism are concerned exactly the way that other speakers describe the measures that the Greek state has taken. I think this provides extra security. You can come to Greece. Uh, Greece is not affected by the virus. Uh, managed to uh, handle it very well. And the protocols being put in place uh, is currently a safe and happy uh, stay uh, to recharge the batteries. And especially as a Greek who a lot of times suffer from too many tourists, uh, I would say this year it will be a little more relaxed, uh, a little less crowded. Uh, and maybe more in China. It's, it's hard to believe that we've come to the end of, of our time. I want to thank all of our speakers for the incredible work that you are doing to keep Greece safe and to uh, really begin to rebuild uh, and bolster trust and governance uh, in Greece. That's something that is a huge inspiration to all of us that we, we see Greece from the outside. Um, I also feel very compelled to relay specifically to Dr. Tsiodras um, that your humility and transparency and honesty were truly a beacon of hope for many people well beyond Greece's borders. And I would like to close our proceedings today with some spontaneous remarks that Dr. Tsiodras shared rather poignantly during one of his press conferences. Um, as I feel outside of Greece, they were not um, very well heard and they offer a very powerful and healing message uh, to live by as we face not only the pandemic, but many crises of the current 
moment. Uh, you said, and I translate loosely, an acquaintance wrote to me that we're making too much of a fuss over a bunch of citizens who are elderly and incapacitated by chronic illness. You continued, the miracle of medical science in 2020 is the extension of a high quality life for people who are our mothers and fathers and grandmothers and grandfathers. The answer is that we honor everyone, respect everyone and protect everyone, especially them. We cannot exist or have an identity without them. And on that note, I thank you all. And I hope with God's speed, we can welcome you all back to the Harvard campus very soon. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine.